Okay, thank you for, for being here. Um, my name is Mark Clorbe. I'm a professor at the Woodrow Wilson School and the Center for Human Values. And um, uh, we'll be talking today about important issues having to do with our society and also with recent events of last week. So in the last decade of the 20th, the 20th century, uh, Francis Fukuyama announced the end of history and many pundits at that time uh, believe that uh, the uh, current institutions of uh, capitalist market economy and democratic politics uh, were the ultimate form of society, of human society. Well, clearly, uh, history is, uh, has not ended, um, and uh, many people uh, seem not to be satisfied with the current institutions. So on election day last week, a Reuters Ipsos survey of more than 10,000 voters revealed that about three-fourths of them agreed with a statement that, quote, America needs a strong leader to take the country back from the rich and powerful, unquote. And about the same proportion agreed with a statement that, quote, the American economy is rigged to advantage the rich and powerful, unquote. So this dissatisfaction, this anger about the institutions um, is shared by many people, actually in Europe too, uh, as uh, we have seen with the Brexit vote and, and uh, various forms of protest. So this raises the obvious question um, many people aspire at a better society or at least at a better set of institutions and policies. Is this desire illusory or uh, are there ideas for reforms that will address people's anxieties and, and help fulfill their dreams? How can we understand people's anger and analyze the causes of their plight in order to search for solutions? Um, and many of you, I'm sure, are worrying about whether we are now heading in the direction of such solutions or uh, whether we are instead veering away from them and uh, toward uh, false solutions or uh, scapegoating. To examine these issues today, uh, we have the most qualified uh, panelists. Uh, Michel Lamont is professor of sociology and, African, and of African and African American studies, and the Robert Isle Goldman professor of European studies at Harvard University. She is the director of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard, and she is the current president of the American Sociological Association. Uh, her most recent publications include the co-authored book, Getting Respect, Responding to Stigma and Discrimination in the United States, Brazil, and Israel, published at Princeton University Press this year. And she is also the author of The Dignity of Working Men, Morality and the Boundaries of Race, Class, and Immigration, published in 2000, I think, a book with great relevance to the current uh, situation. Michelle was also a professor at Princeton from uh, 1987 to 2003. Um, Ravi Kambour is the T.H. Lee Professor of World Affairs, International Professor of Applied Economics and Management, and Professor of Economics at Cornell University. He is well known for his work on inequality, development, and uh, economic policy. He has edited almost 60 books and special issues and published more than 200 papers. And he's also known for his engagement in uh, policy making and especially international development. He has been Chief Economist for Africa at the World Bank. Um, and among many things, many hats that he has, he now chairs the board of the UN University WIDER and he's the president of the um, Human Development and Capaci Capabilities Association. And may I say that he has been a visiting fellow and visiting professor at Princeton for uh, several times. Uh, Suzanne Fiske is uh, the Eugene Higgins Professor of uh, Psychology and Professor of Public Affairs here at Princeton. She is famous for her work on social cognition and her work on stereotyping and, and prejudice. She has published more than 300 papers, edited many books, and is the author of Envy Up, Scorn Down, uh, How Status Divides Us, uh, published in 2011, and co-author of The Human Brand, How We Relate to People, Products, and Companies, uh, published in 2013. And she has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Before I, I let uh, our panelists give their opening remarks, uh, I must explain that our discussion today is, um, is not just based on our personal works, but also involves the collective analysis of the 260 authors of, uh, from more than, than 40 countries of the report of the International Panel on Social Progress, IPSP, that has the widely, uh, some say crazy, uh, uh, crazily ambitious goal of um, providing a new vision for a better society in the 21st century. And this event today is a part of a series of similar events happening in various countries, presenting the first draft of the report, which is now public and open for comments by everyone. 
so you are warmly all invited to uh, browse the chapters of this first draft on our online platform and give your comments. Just go to ipsp.org, ipsp.org. The comments that come before the end of this year will be used to prepare the final uh, draft of the, of the report. Uh, Michel is a lead author in the chapter of the report that uh, deals with uh, belonging and solidarity. Uh, Ravi is um, also a lead author in the, the chapter that deals with the role of social sciences in policy making and institutional change, but he's also the co-chair of the Scientific Council of the panel, and Ravi and I are both members of the steering, steering committee. Moreover, many students in Princeton, and I'm not sure there are uh, some in the room today, but many are assistants to this project, and Princeton University, especially the, the Center for Human Values and the Woodrow Wilson School, have been key supporting institutions of this initiative. So in the IPSP, given the turn of events in various countries, we believe that the recent developments prove the importance of our project of rethinking society, and that we researchers have a special responsibility uh, to help understand what's going on and help find ways toward a better world. Now, let me turn to uh, our panelists, and I propose that we start by looking at the deep economic uh, drivers of social trends and uh, growing inequalities, such as globalization and technical progress. Um, and so, Ravi, let me ask you if we are condemned to endure uh, growing inequalities and social disintegration, or if policy can help us uh, deal with that, uh, and perhaps should we have uh, done more about that uh, in the past, and how do you see the future? Ravi. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mark. And excuse my cough, so I'm going to be uh, uh, sipping this uh, glass of water. Well, thank you for the invitation, and thank you uh, uh, to all of you for, uh, for coming. So I want to start with a question, which is, uh, are we living in an age of rising inequality? Uh, to most people, the answer might be obviously yes. Mm -hmm. um, and by, let me start by saying, by, by economic inequality, I mean conventional measures of income inequality, the share of the top 1%, the share of the top 10%, et cetera, the, the numbers that you've seen uh, in the, in the popular, uh, popular press. There may be other dimensions of inequality, uh, which, which we can also discuss uh, uh, later on. Now, there's, of course, a narrative that the basic forces of technology and globalization are leading to rising inequality. That technology is such that it's, dis it's displacing uh, basic labor in favor of capital and in favor of skilled labor and that this is creating uh, a tremendous uh, divergence in incomes uh, uh, everywhere around the world. This is the basic force, economic force, of technological change. And of course, what globalization does is that it spreads this force to all countries. If this, occur if this change in technology occurs in one country, it pretty soon spreads like wildfire to other countries. So these twin forces of technology and globalization are the underlying forces making for rising inequality. So in that sense, it could be said that we're living in an age of rising inequality. This wasn't true 50 years ago. The technology wasn't progressing in this way. Actually, technology was favoring the, hi the hiring of basic labor. Just think of all those uh, uh, light, light industrial uh, expansions in Korea and uh, Malaysia and so on in their period of industrialization 50 years ago. So we're in a different age just now. Well, uh, so those are the basic forces. What do the facts tell us? Again, I don't need to tell you that in the US, the UK, and Europe, uh, inequality has been rising. The share of the top 1%, et cetera. I could have complicated charts and graphs up here, but basically you know, you know the story. Okay? Uh, no matter how you measure it, uh, inequality is rising uh, in these countries, in, uh, in US and in Western Europe. Actually, inequality is also rising, as, as conventionally measured, in the big Asian economies, in China, in India, in Bangladesh, and so on. So we may, we may feel as though, yes, indeed, we are living in an age of rising inequality. We have the basic forces, and we have the facts which show that these forces have played out in the US, in the UK, uh, in uh, China, in India, in Bangladesh, Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera, where inequality is actually rising. But not so fast. There's a part of the world where, in the last 20 years, inequality has been falling. Okay? It's a part of the world that we normally associate with high inequality. And that is Latin America. It, it may surprise you, because we think of Latin America as being the poster child for high inequality. But actually, in the last 20 years, if I was leave aside the last three to four years where there's been a crisis and so on, OK? So in the 1990s, in the 2000s, right the way through to the mid-2000s, the usual conventional measures of inequality, the very same ones which have been rising in the US and the UK, et cetera, have been falling in all the big Latin American economies. Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Chile, you name it. 
inequality has been falling. And presumably, these countries have faced the same forces of technology and globalization as US, UK, Europe, etc. So what's going on? How can it be that one part of the world shows, bucks the trend of rising inequality? And the answer is straightforward. It is that policy matters. Policy matters. In the US, in the UK in particular, uh, the trends that I mentioned of, of, uh, of uh, the inequality trends from technology were absorbed into the economy. Not only were they absorbed, they were intensified because actually policy, were, uh, policy led to less progressive income taxation, uh, less spending on basic education, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? In countries like India and Asia, India and China, these trends were basically absorbed. In Latin America, the trends were countered by policy. The trends were countered by policy in terms of direct redistribution uh, and also in terms of indirect, uh, uh, indirect policy interventions in the, uh, on, the front, uh, on education and so on. I can talk about this in greater detail, but you know, conditional cash transfers in Latin America, which are essentially transfers to households, conditional upon them keeping their kids in secondary schools. Massive programs, there's a massive program, several percentage points of GDP are going into these programs. And all evaluations show that it had tremendous impact on actually increasing the supply of skilled labor, which of course has counteracted the rising demand for skilled labor from technology, thereby keeping the gap between skilled income and unskilled income uh, in check. It's not the only thing. I mean, there are lots of other things, other labor market policies uh, in terms of minimum wages and so on. Okay? And we can discuss this in detail, but there is a part of the world where policy has held in check rising inequality, facing the same trends, the same global forces. Let me give you another example, which is actually China. Now, China, you remember I said, was an example of rising inequality. True, actually, we think of China as being, again, the poster child for rising inequality. And from, from the mid-1980s uh, to the mid-2000s, inequality in China did rise. Again, all the conventional measures went up. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, I did some of the early work showing that inequality was rising in China. And when we showed that, sort of uh, uh, people in the World Bank and other places said, why are you spoiling the party, okay? Uh, you know, China's growing at 10% uh, per annum, poverty is coming down, and there you go talking about rising inequality. Hmm? And you know, the view that we took was, you know, if you don't understand rising inequality in China, you don't understand the development process in China. But what's been happening, but interestingly, what has been happening in the last few years, the last seven or eight years, okay, is that inequality in China has plateaued. It is not rising as fast, Maybe even, it depends on what data you use and all that, but you know, I don't want to get into the technical details, but it may actually be beginning to turn down. What we may be seeing in China is the great Chinese inequality turnaround. Okay? Again, facing the same forces from the mid-2000s onwards, it has changed. But what changed? What changed between 19, with the mid-80s and mid-2000s compared to the mid-2000s onwards was that government policy changed. Okay? Uh, the, uh, the party Congress met, and harmonious development became the label. Okay? They saw the consequences of rising inequality, and specific policies, massive specific policies were put in place. The westward strategy, uh, investing in lagging regions, social programs in urban areas and rural areas, etc. cetera. Okay? So policy makes a difference. It was a massive shift of policy from the mid-80s to the mid-2000s to the mid-2000s onwards. Now, we'll see how this plays out, and, and you know, uh, as I said, there's some uh, technical issues, academic di discussions on data and so on and so forth, but certainly our work, we, we argue that it may not be coming down, but Chinese inequality is beginning to peak and plateau in this, uh, in this setting. So, policy matters. And you may ask yourself the question, what changed between the, mid uh, between the 20 years and now? And actually, Bin Wong, who's a very distinguished historian at, at, uh, of, of China at Berkeley, has looked at the records of the Qing Dynasty, uh, going back 300 years. And his argument is essentially that concern about inequality is hardwired into the Chinese economic management psyche. Because when you're ruling a vast, fissiparous empire whose outlying provinces are being nibbled at by, uh, uh, by outside powers, you always worry about inequality. Okay? And the way he puts it, he puts it quite humorously, is when, when, there was a, when there would be an uprising in one of these provinces, two things would happen. The center would first send in the army, <laughs> and second, send in the irrigation engineers, okay? basically to develop, uh, develop the place and so on. So my, the basic point I want to make with the example of, with the, example of, the Lat of Latin America 
and of China is that policy matters, policy matters. So, so Bin Wong's position view is that actually the 20 years of rising inequality may be the aberration in China. Uh, it may, that may, and, and that somehow we're gonna snap back to the, to the, to the, uh, to the normal state of affairs. You know, you'll all be familiar with the Deng Xiaoping's famous statement, for all of us to get rich, some will have to get rich first. And Manmohan Singh, who was the Prime Minister of India, and sort of a democratic socialist type, before he became Prime Minister, visited China, and he said to Deng Xiaoping, but, but uh, uh, sir, uh, aren't you worried about rising, aren't you worried that inequality will rise with your, with your, uh, with your programs? And Deng Xiaoping said, I hope so. Because <laughs> he had a very clear notion that he was willing to pay that price uh, and, and institute policies uh, that would give growth with rising inequality. But from the mid-2000s onwards, it has snapped back to what Bin Wang would argue is the normal in, in, in China. So the basic point I want to make to you is that policy matters. Let me now conclude by asking a second question to which actually I don't, I don't have a clear answer, I don't have the expertise, but I'm hoping that my colleagues will have the expertise to, for this question, which is the following. In the US and the UK, inequality is rising, we know that, okay? U, UK, Western Europe, and so on. What does rising income inequality do to, do to income class solidarity versus solidarity across other cleavages like ethnic, uh, ethnic cleavages? So we've observed rising economic inequality, rising income inequality. What does that do to solidarity, to cl income class solidarity versus ethnic solidarity across ethnic cleavages in societies which have those cleavages uh, uh, to start with? Well, of course, a standard sort of normal economist analysis might suggest that you know, income class solidarity should increase with rising income inequality, okay? That those who are losing out should come together as a group across ethnic cleavages, okay, to find this. But it seems as though rising inequality has actually magnified those cleavages across ethnic groups. Rising income inequality has magnified the cleavages across ethnic groups. And it's, it's an important question, it's, first of all, it's, it's an important question for us, to, uh, for us to ask why that is the case. Why is that the case that this happens? Why does rising income inequality not lead to rising class solidarity, but actually to rising cleavages across it. Well, here's a, here's a sort of thought process which, and I, I'll leave you with this. Suppose there are 1,000 people looking for jobs, but there are only 900 jobs on offer. In other words, the unemployment rate is 10%. In Europe, actually, the unemployment rate is 20%, and amongst youth, it's 40%, okay? say in Spain, for example. So 1,000 people looking for jobs, only 900 jobs available, so 100 of those are not gonna get jobs. Take a completely homogeneous society which has no cleavages other than, uh, no, no other cleavages. And suppose the allocation of jobs is random across these, uh, across these thousand people. Well, some people get jobs, some people don't get jobs and so on. Uh, well, that, but there are no other cleavages at all in the society. But now consider a society in which there's a cleavage across ethnic groups. Even a purely random allocation of jobs across people will mean that there will be people of ethnic group A and ethnic group B who are unemployed, who are in the unemployed pool, okay? And even if one was to try to explain to somebody of ethnic group A that this is actually random allocation, is nothing to do with the fact that they're of ethnic group A versus ethnic group B, okay? It is quite natural for you to, I hope you can see that one can exploit the notion that the reason why ethnic group A is unemployed okay, is because ethnic group B has a job. And even though this is purely random, random allocation, okay? And of course, we know that actually certain ethnic groups have an even higher rate of unemployment uh, than other ethnic groups. Even if you have that in case, it, you can see how that, that mentality, that psychology can be, can be exploited by, by political entrepreneurs in this case. So what's the policy response? Well, one may be say, well, we have to work to reduce ethnic cleavages, et cetera, et cetera. That's a medium-term, long-term process. But suppose unemployment, the unemployment rate was zero. The issue would not arise. The issue simply would not arise if the unemployment rate was zero. And of course, the issue also arises when you have public housing, which is rationed, which is the case in the US, uh, which is the case in the UK and Europe, or you have health services, which are publicly provided but are rationed. Even if the rationing is randomly allocated, the moment you have these ethnic cleavages, there's an opening for these sorts of issues to arise. And the policy response to, get, to address that 
is actually to make sure the rationing doesn't arise, to have high levels of employment and low rates of unemployment. And that's how one can, one can address, at least in this context, from an economic point of view, these policy issues. So let me just conclude to say, policy matters, policy matters. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ravi, um, for this uh, very nice introduction to the key issues. Uh, we will not uh, lose uh, inequalities from sight, and Michel will now talk about issues having to do more with respect and discrimination, but also the link with inequality. And so, Michel, is the U.S. a special country in this respect, and what should we do if we think ahead in the future? Well, thank you so much, Mark. Do you want your slides to be Okay, well, first I want to thank Mark for inviting me to join you today. It's a real pleasure. I was just telling him, having taught at Princeton for 15 years, I go to rooms and I think, I remember being here so many years ago. What happened there? I think in that room it was a mentoring thing when I was a new assistant professor. So it's very nice to be back. I want also to thank him and to thank Ravi for the unbelievable experience that is this uh, social progress report. It's a real feat to bring together people from a wide range of social sciences <coughs> to get us to think together about um, issues of social progress. So you just heard about uh, one dimension of inequality, which is distribution. I'm part of the people who are focusing on recognition. Uh, there's a classical paper by Nancy Fraser, The Politics of Distribution and Recognition as Two Dimensions of Inequality. One can look at issues of belonging and cultural membership and solidarity as having to do with how you cultivate in a wider uh, circle of the population a sense that they are worthy. And a lot of what we have seen during the presidential election particularly had to do with contest around who is worthy and who's less worthy. So that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about, and I'm gonna give you in five minutes an overview of 30 years of scholarship, but then I'm gonna conclude with a few comments pertaining specifically to the uh, election, because for those of us who were teaching, what we saw on Wednesday is that a lot of graduate students were wondering, am I doing the right thing with my life? Should I become an activist? A lot of faculty, I watched the election, with a few prominent political scientists who concluded our dis discipline is totally bankrupt. So because we had not anticipated what happened. So this is really a moment of soul searching for uh, the social sciences, I think. Whether you are Democrat or Republican, I think there's a lot of <coughs> questions that have not been addressed. And uh, I'm gonna give you a few, really the talk is more, I guess, analytical than empirical. You will see where I'm going. So I'm gonna to talk to you first very briefly about a research project that I've been co-directing for 14 years with Peter Hall, a political scientist. We were asked, I'm Canadian, he's Canadian, there's a big Canadian foundation who asked us, please assemble a group of uh, social scientists and think together about how to produce collective uh, well-being, uh, which can be captured by this, these words, successful societies. So we assembled a group of people that included a leading uh, philosopher of uh, multiculturalism, Will Kimlicka, a historian, a geographer, all kinds of people who were able, who were equipped intellectually to tap the different dimensions of what societal success is about. So what you see here on the slide are the different dimensions. So of course you, have, you go from dimensions such as, as health measures, low infant mortality, high life expectancy, that most people would agree are crucially important. You have also the economic measures, but the, the dimensions that are in red are the ones that are more unexpected. Weak, porous group boundaries, or plurality of definitions of worth and self so that there's no losers. No one can think of themselves as losers because you don't have to be a loser if you don't make a lot of money. Different ways of defining a worthy life and the promotion of diversity. We wrote two books. The first book titled Successful Society uh, use, like Amatra Sen, a capability approach but emphasize more collective uh, capabilities than individual capabilities and put a lot of emphasis on the role of institutions and cultural repertoires in acting as buffers or scaffolding 
to give people the means that they need in order to become all they can be. So as Ravi was just saying, policy matters. That was partly one of the takeaways. A second book focused on what happens under neoliberalism, and neoliberalism can be understood as a number of social changes that happen simultaneously <coughs> and have to do with the domination of market principles of organization over social life. One dimension that is partly crucial here is that through the process of neoliberalism that became dominant from the 80s on, people come to define their own worth in terms of their socioeconomic achievement. When I conducted interviews in the uh, late uh, early 1990s for my book, uh, The Dignity of Working Man, one of the questions I asked black and white working class men in New York and white and North African working class men in Paris, what kind of people do you feel inferior and superior to and who is your hero? Donald Trump was very salient already. People used him as the epitome of socioeconomic success. Others said Mother Teresa. I was interested in how they spoke about their heroes precisely because it captured a set of virtues. And this led me to want to understand how boundaries that characterize societies can be contrasted. So I did uh, 150 interviews uh, with these individuals, and I concluded through such questions as those that I just mentioned, that the two societies then were organized around very different kinds of boundaries, with very weak boundaries toward Muslims, North African immigrants in France, and much weaker boundaries toward the poor and blacks. And these differences were explained in part by the persistent influence of socialism, Catholicism, and republicanism in the French context, which led people to think of the market as essentially unfair and as producing people who will necessarily be excluded. And therefore, you cannot blame morally the poor for the fact that they're poor. And in fact, you have to en engage in them and demonstrate solidarity. And a lot of the, the respondents that I talked to then talked about the importance of having solidarity toward the poor, as well as solidarity toward the working class. The, the black were much less salient then than they are now, in part because there were fewer uh, West African <coughs> immigrants who were Muslim. So the boundaries between blacks and, uh, toward blacks and Muslim then in the French context were far less salient than it is now. And the boundaries toward North African were already strong, but much weaker than they became since. So uh, we know from papers that I wrote since that these boundaries have really changed with the growing influence of uh, neoliberalism. For instance, the youth with a very high level of unemployment are now much more salient. In the US at the time, you already had the very strong boundaries toward the poor and toward blacks where people would say as they were the first chapter of the book is titled The World in Moral Order. I would interview those workers about you know, low status white collar workers and blue collar workers about what kind of people do you think you are? And they would say, I'm a hard working person. I make sure that my kids stay out of prison, that they go to school and I pay my bills and I struggle and I'm a survivor and I'm much better than these guys who uh, live off welfare, these black people, blah, blah, blah. So they would very quickly slide from drawing moral boundaries to class boundaries and racial boundaries. That was basically what I found in the US. Boundaries toward immigrants were much weaker then than they would be today, certainly. So against this background, we can think about what we have seen during the elections. Uh, the electoral uh, campaign, which was certainly uh, on the Republican side, a, a constant pushing of all these boundaries that has led many of us become kind of concerned about what is the future of the United States when it comes to, to social inclusion. So this slide here speaks to you about uh, the literature on, on inequality. If you take a class uh, in the sociology of inequality, First, you would learn, learn about type one process, which is opportunity hoarding, domination, exploitation. This is for those of you who have read Marx, Das Kapital, that's basically what it's about. It's the things that the rich do to the poor. Here we're thinking about inequality as something that is exercised from the top down. The second kind of process is a literature that has exploded since 1980, which is the literature on cultural capital. Uh, and it's basically about ways in which the middle class imposes its standards on other classes through the school system 
uh, as we choose our friends, uh, when we decide whether we want, uh, how, what are the criteria by which we choose our friends, it might have to do with, for instance, whether they're sophisticated culturally or not. Uh, the class struggle, these theories argue, have moved from the economic realm to everyday interaction. If you, don't, if you choose your friends based on what kind of movies they, what kind of food they eat, et cetera, you engage in a form of cultural exclusion that feeds into inequality. And the third kind of process is really what I'm talking about. The process through which in everyday life, group experience, exclusion, stigmatization, racialization. So we can understand, you know, these questions of how we define solidarity and belonging at the level of uh, these boundaries that exist among the majority group, but also how the minority group experiences them. And that's what I studied with uh, collaborators in a book that just came out, titled Getting Respect, where we conducted over 400 interviews uh, in the United States, Brazil, and Israel. And we uh, asked those individuals to describe to us uh, moments or incidents where they feel that they were treated unfairly and how, what happened to them, how did they react. And we try to make sense of the differences. And we are looking at uh, five different groups who are African Americans, black Brazilians. And in Israel, we uh, focus on three groups, Ethiopian Jews, uh, Mizrahim, who are Oriental Jews, and Arab Palestinians. Normally, you know, we might have focused on only three groups, focusing on the main victim of racism in the three countries. And Arab Palestinians would obviously have stand out. But we decided to add uh, Ethiopian Jews so that we could have black people in the three countries. And uh, what we did then is really draw uh, to a very <coughs> detailed inductive analysis patterns. What kind of experiences do they talk about most? One of the main findings of the book is that they mostly talk about assault on their sense of self, being ignored, misunderstood, underestimated. Most of the US literature on racism has to do with discrimination, not having access to resources, to housing, education, jobs. What we find in our interview is most of what they talk about is these experiences of assault on their sense of self, the fact of being not recognized as full members. So, the, the guy who walks into an elevator and one of the guys in the elevator or the white guys in the elevator makes a joke about blacks and monkeys and he says, I'm, I'm about to die, I'm about to kill the guy, I just have to get out of here before I strangle him. So assaults, these experiences, cumulative experiences, have been described in the literature as, you know, it's called the allostatic load, the wear and tear for everyday life that comes with experiences of exclusion and inequality and which translates into huge differences in, uh, uh, you know, racial disparities uh, in the U.S. in particular. So we identify these patterns and we find that different types of experiences prevail in different places. Black Brazilian, most often the kind of experience they have is to be stereotyped as uh, low income, poor, and uneducated. In the United States, the main kind of experience is simply to be insulted, to be called the N-word, to be mistreated, and to be misunderstood. That's extremely high, because they expect to be understood. Why do they expect to be understood? Because there's been the civil rights movement. They believe that the United States, to a large degree, is now a country that should give them right of full treatment. And we are comparing the kind of experiences that middle class and working class people experience. The differences are much uh, smaller than what we had expected, but they are somewhat present nevertheless. And the big difference is that middle class people expect that their college degree should give them a right to, to full treatment. Then we look also at their responses. In the US, Amer African Americans confront much more than anyone else. So I don't have time to give you a lot of detail, but really then the question is, what will explain these patterns of confrontation? Another category we describe as management of the self, which is essentially to say, I don't want to be the angry lawyer again today. I want to be, I mean, the angry black woman again today. I want to be the respected lawyer. So all this internal work that people go through to kind of define how to respect. And these responses are fed by many, many things. And this is what this slide is about, which is to say that they are fed by the cultural repertoires that people have access to. If you live in a context where Zionism tells you that you are a full member of the society because you're Jewish and you happen to be a black Jewish person, you, we find, downplay 
the extent to which you're being stigmatized by, and you believe that one day you will be fully integrated in a society just as the Russian Jews who have immigrated to Israel <coughs> have become. Same thing with the Mizrahim who are located at the bottom of the socioeconomic uh, status hierarchy and yet who believe that they are not suffering from a lot of uh, discrimination. So um, we also analyze the extent to which each group is a group, which is very important because the two groups that are most weakly defined are in our sample uh, black Brazilians and Mizrahim, and they don't necessarily respond the same way, the same, just as the Arab Palestinians and the African Americans don't respond the same way. So the, what does it leave us in terms of where we should go moving forward? Well, what is ahead is I think, especially if Republicans control uh, all of uh, the, the various you know, branches in Washington, a lot of the opposition is gonna move to the public sphere. And I think social scientists will play a particularly important role in producing repertoires that can facilitate greater social inclusion. We know from the literature on resilience that hope is fed by narratives. So I think that it's gonna be our job in part to provide people uh, narratives to try to make sense of, of what is ahead of us. And uh, I think we need to give very serious thought to producing narratives that have to do with social inclusion. I think there's gonna be a, you know, we know what's ahead in terms of uh, uh, dealings with, with Latinos, uh, you know, with Muslims, et cetera. So I think that we need to think very seriously about deploying the kind of cultural resources that will uh, sustain uh, social resilience. A lot of what the social sciences have done over the last 10 years, or 20 years for that matter, is focus on what's happening between the two ears. The cognitive turn is extremely important. A lot of the current literature on, po on poverty, for instance, is emphasizing the importance of nudging the poor toward um, uh, you know, having access to, uh, you know, public services that are available to them. I think that it will be time for the social sciences to zoom out, to think about the social processes that lead, that have led the working class, the white working class in particular, to vote the way they have. We're gonna have to spend a lot of time thinking much more broadly about what enables and constrain different kinds of behavior. So I'm simply gonna stop here and I look forward to discussing this more in the question period. Thank you. So thank you very much, Michel, for bringing these uh, insights about the uh, mechanisms and also perhaps the politics of uh, recognition and the um, uh, movements of the various boundaries and the different locations in different countries. So now let's look at the social psychology of these mechanisms and especially of stereotyping with the help of Suzanne. So I, I will be brief. I really only have a couple points I'd like for you to consider. I'm a social psychologist, so I will look at face-to-face -face interactions and groups interacting with other groups and the impact on people's voting behavior, among other things. So with increasing inequality, what we find when we compare across countries, people use more complicated stereotypes because there's more to explain. So the more inequality you have, you have to distinguish between the deserving poor and the undeserving poor, that's in quotes, and the deserving rich and the undeserving rich. So you can't just have simple up and down stereotypes. So I think we can see that people are telling more complicated stories as there's more income inequality in a given country, and the US is right up there with pretty high income inequality. One of the dimensions of these more complicated stereotypes, the most important dimension, is people's perceived status is seen to predict their perceived competence. And this is, in, in effect, a belief in meritocracy. If somebody is high status, they must have earned it. If they're low status, they must deserve that. So that's the predominant stereotypic narrative that people have. What this means is that people who are higher status are in effect looking down on people who are lower status. And this is a respect issue. And I think the single biggest issue in the previous election that we just had and in the current political climate here is respect or disrespect. And that a lot of the, as a psychologist, what I see is 
the emotions that carry a lot of people's voting preferences are a reaction to disrespect. So what we find when we analyze the best predictors of people's votes are that emotions are the best predictor of the votes. People have beliefs. They have beliefs about the traits of the candidates. They have beliefs about what issues matter. But the single best predictor of people's voting choice is emotions. And so what you find is that when people are angry, they are more likely to vote for a candidate who they believe channels their anger. And I think that this is an important takeaway message, both in the American election and in the Brexit vote, and in other elections that are coming up in other countries. So I just want to urge us to think, you know, many people in this room are elites, certainly faculty and important institutions, in quotes, are elites. And I think we have a responsibility to think harder about respect and disrespect up and down the hierarchy. Thank you very much, uh, Suzanne, for bringing this issue of respect. And um, the three panelists have said that we need to do more research. Uh, this is a bit worrisome. I was hoping we would get a lot of answers, uh, but we, are, we seem to be getting even more questions. Uh, but now it is time to, uh, for the, uh, the audience to uh, bring their questions, and let's hope we'll be able to provide some answers. Um, I, uh, given that we are in a university here, the students are strongly encouraged to be the first to ask questions, but of course, uh, after that, it's open to, to everyone. So who wants to start? Please come to the, uh, to the mics, if you don't mind, uh, so that we can hear the questions uh, well. Uh, thank you very much. My question is particularly for Professor Fisk, uh, but of course, I'm happy to hear comments from all of you. Um, I was struck when you said that uh, Americans believe they live in a meritocracy. And those who are at the top deserve to be there, and those who are at the bottom um, deserve to be where they are. Um, do you think in terms of, um, to the extent that this election was a reaction to the last eight years of the Obama presidency, that some people had cognitive dissonance and couldn't handle the fact that the person who was at the very top uh, was African American? I think there's a general reaction um, to demographic change in the United States. So in addition to um, perceptions of globalization and immigration changing America as we know it, I think in addition, you know, having a black president makes that sa particularly salient. Um, but I think that um, there's evidence that people who feel displaced by the ch demographic changes that are happening in the society um, are particularly wanting um, to uh, restore their place as respected members of society. So I think one thing that's important is that sometimes when you're looking at other people's behavior, you personalize it and you think, oh, this individual person <coughs> is voting a certain way because of their individual experience. But people actually more often vote their group. So it's, you know, so if I'm out of work, I don't vote differently. I, what it depends on is my, me seeing what the, um, my group's identity is and how they're doing as a group. So people are kind of altruistic in their vote or, or at least um, communal in their votes. Uh, so I, you know, so it's more like, I think, seeing broad demographic changes in the country than a particular president, although he reflects those changes and perhaps makes them particularly salient. But I think people are concerned about um, things are changing. Do the other panelists want to uh, also add something to this uh, on this point? Well, just to add something that is very congruent with what Sue just said. I mean, there's a famous theory, which is theory of sense of group positioning, which was provided by Martin Boomer, and it, you know. Many people are arguing that what is happening now is reflective of this general principle being in action. You know, why people feel very much, the, it's the Arlie Oxshill argument, the book that 
she published a few months ago that you know the white working class feels like black people cut in line, which means that what was their legitimate place has now been questioned. Um, a recent study of people who suffered from long-term employment in Israel and the US has shown that in the two countries, people react ra radically differently to these experiences. In the US, workers will find within themselves the passion that they think they need to sell themselves, so it's a very individualist reaction. Whereas in Israel, there's you know, the notion that the market is unfair, that people will be unemployed, and they're much more distant, and they protect themselves much more from the experience of uh, being unemployed. So this means that this meritocratic beliefs that Susan talked about uh, come really at a cost for American workers, for people who are at the bottom of the hierarchy. They have fewer ideas that are available to them to protect themselves, and the only, so, you know, the self-help culture that is being spoon-fed, uh, even to our graduate students, as they are now, or to our undergrad, as people are now reacting to the outcome of the, uh, of the election, I gather that in all our universities, the, the, therapy, the, the mental health services are being exploding with demand. We are feeding people a lot of individualized assistance. And I think, you know, there's really a need to provide uh, tools for dealing with this that are not only at the level of individual well being, but also the tools of the social sciences to help people understand, which is partly why this session is here today. Please. is directed to uh, Professor Kambler. You described um, a dynamic in which developed countries are seeing increasing inequality. The countries you described where we're seeing decreasing inequality tended to be economically less developed. On a global basis, research I've seen argues that, on, that really we're coming closer together and we're seeing greater and greater equality on a global basis. My question is, is, is really part of what we're seeing is, for example, loss of jobs to the third world from the U.S. Uh, creating part of the increasing inequality in the U.S. And that's part of the price that we have to pay today to, in, uh, to de decrease global inequality. Okay, good. Well, thank you. That's a very, very good question. So there are two uh, angles to that. One is a sort of a, a normative angle, which is... Suppose inequality in every country uh, increases, but because poorer countries on average are coming closer to richer countries on average, inequality in the world as a whole decreases. It's intuitively clear. You can think of inequality in the world as a whole as being composed of two things, inequality between countries on average, and then inequality within countries on average. And what, what is going on just now, leaving aside the Latin America example for the moment, is that inequality within countries is increasing. That's what we've been talking about. But China has been growing at 10% per year, whereas the US has been growing at 1% per year or 2% per year. And there's a massive narrowing on average between the two. So what is our normative perspective on this? Uh, are we saying that the world is a better place now because the world distribution of income has narrowed? even though inequality in every single country uh, has increased. And these are the sort of tensions that one, that one faces. When you, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I just have a, have a formulation uh, uh, of, the question, of, uh, of the question to you. Actually, I do have, I do have an answer to that, which is that uh, I believe that, that the polity within the nation state uh, is extremely important. And in fact, a reaction from people when we say, uh, but inequality is increasing in the US and so on, uh, a reaction from people who, uh, of, of a of a respondent of a certain type is, yes, but world inequality has gone down. That should give you a clue <laughs> to, uh, to this. The second is quite, in, is quite interesting, that at, at what is leading to this. Okay? And that uh, Branko Milanovic has a very interesting graph of, uh, of the world distribution of income uh, 20 years ago and today. And who are the gainers and the losers in this uh, thing? Okay? The, the, very, the very poorest, uh, the very richest for a start, have gained a lot, that we know. The very poorest, the very, very poorest in terms of the world distribution have also gained. Okay? The greatest losses have come about 60 or 70 percent of the way up the world income distribution, which of course is exactly where the working class uh, of, uh, of uh, US and Europe, uh, Europe is. So there is indeed some truth to this, to this statement that it's the movement of technology 
and trade, which has led to this, uh, uh, led to this issue. So let me just go back to another, uh, so link that to this issue. Of, you know, so we, uh, we, we have a situation where people see both an increase in inequality and a rise in immigration, let's say, which is what you're seeing in, in, in Europe, for example. Okay? Uh, and it is quite natural to make an association between those two. No matter how much technical analysis can show uh, that actually it's the technology change which is doing this, and that the, that the effect of uh, this immigration on wages is actually minimal, it's, I mean, uh, uh, if at all anything. A, a report from the, from the National Science Foundation just recently uh, chaired by my colleague Fran Blau that makes, makes, this sort of, makes this sort of point. Okay? So that's the issue. No matter how much you can explain technically that the rise in inequality and the increase in immigration in Europe or in the US are not technically connected because of the sorts of issues that we've been talking about, they, are connect they become connected in people's minds. And, that, and, and we're now reaping the, uh, the whirlwind. Yes, please. Hi. Um, hi. Um, this question is directed towards you, Professor Kandor, but um, of course, we welcome um, opinions from everyone. Um, during your presentation, you were talking about um, a situation where people are basically there's a, basically, people have a, an image of Pareto efficiency in their mind, where um, if a person from ethnic group A mm -hmm. gets something, it's at the expense of someone from ethnic group B. Um, this goes directly against the idea of the American dream, which is that I can work hard, make money, and I will be, I'll be prosperous. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with the person by me or whatever. How, when did this change? When did we move from this idea of the American dream? When did we wake up? and come to this Pareto efficiency system. And you um, just talked about immigration. How is this linked to the future of immigration, especially in the political climate today? Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I think my colleagues are probably better uh, qualified to answer, to answer that question than, than I am. But let me just note, this, is, uh, this, this issue, by the way, is not just US, Europe, and so on. You know? If you go to Malaysia, okay, there's a tremendous immigration of Indonesians, uh, Bangladeshis, and so on to Malaysia. And the same issues are arising in terms of Malaysian workers, the, 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 uh, in, uh, domestic Malaysian workers, vis-a-vis -vis these things. I mean, it, 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 it's, a, it's a global phenomenon. It's not just, it's not just in, this, uh, in this context. So uh, to, me, to me, in a sense, it, it's actually quite natural when you have these cleavages. So let's take those as given for now. And then the example that I gave to you, but let me just repeat the example for public, for public housing, which is what you have in, in, in the UK, right? You have, a thousand places, you have a thousand people looking for public housing, 900 public housing places available. So 100 of those are not gonna get it. Not gonna get it, okay? So if I don't get it, but I see a Somali refugee uh, getting a uh, public place, the fact that it was random allocation, <laughs> the fact that in some overall sense it was fair, it, it, in our technical sense, doesn't cut any ice whatsoever in this thing. The, the response to it is firstly to address those ethnic cleavages directly, which I believe is a long-term process, or you create the 100 new public housing places, which, which reduce the, un the unemployment rate to zero or the, or the, uh, uh, or the uh, uh, public housing uh, shortage to zero. That is a thing we can do quickly. <laughs> that is a thing we can do, which we have the instruments to do. Uh, and that would be my, my sort of uh, economists. <laughs> perspective on this, on this thing. Yeah. Let, let me weigh in on that as well. Um, we've studied stereotypes all over the world, and the thing that really amazed me is that the perception that high-status people are competent and low-status people are incompetent is not just an American disease. <laughs> I mean, I, as a social scientist, I'm, I focus on how circumstances encourage or discourage people's status. And so I thought people would recognize that circumstances matter. But all over the world, the correlation is about 0.8. I mean, it's as if you're measuring the same thing twice, status <coughs> and personal capability. So if that's such a robust belief that people have, essentially it's meritocracy beliefs, then that means that when people think the, sy the system is rigged, that meritocracy doesn't work, as you put it, the American dream doesn't work, they're gonna be extremely angry because this is such a core belief about how things work. And so I think this is part of the dynamic that we're seeing. So just to add one more wrinkle to uh, how you can approach this question, 
I think it's hard to say, you know, in 1965, people stopped believing in the American dream. I'm much more tempted to think about, you know, what are the uh, social actors, the social movements, the uh, media that diffuse a notion that solidarity is important? Uh, and this can be traced uh, historically. In a recent paper written in uh, Social Science and Medicine, I traced the, the process of destigmatization of people with HIV AIDS, the obese, and African Americans, three groups that are very unequally destigmatized. But these are social processes. So I think this is a different way of asking the question. We know that in the last 30 years, LBGT, uh, LG, you know, gay people, uh, women, uh, African Americans have been destigmatized largely in the American context. There's been a growing ideology of inclusion at the same time as it is being argued. Um, the boundaries toward the poor have become much more based on uh, their lack of deservingness. So how can these, you, it's a little bit related to one of the questions, why are these two changes open, happening at the same time? So the tools I have as a sociologist is really to analyze, to trace over time, these changes in the shared understanding of the meaning of these groups, which is not a, a, a constant and that is partly historically determined because, for instance, the notion of working class solidarity was extremely present in the United States in 1980. And those of us who are old enough remember when Reagan break, broke the unions in, in 1980. These are historical changes that can be traced. Hi, I have a pr question for Professor Fisk. Um, you said that emotions are the best predictors of how people vote, and I'm interested then is there any room for education? Um, especially in the Wilson School, we think about educated, informed, and engaged voters, and we have kind of this dream of this very politically um, <coughs> informed public, but is that even important? And if that is important, are there any ways to give people some sort of information to guide their decisions, or is that just not? at issue? Is it really the deeper issues that lead to these emotions that we should be worried about? Well, people, people's emotions derive from what they think is information. And sometimes that information is evidence-based in a way that college faculty would agree with, and sometimes it's based on other sources. And so I think that we have a responsibility to put out what we believe to be accurate information based on evidence, social science evidence. Um, so I think, you know, I'm a professor, I have to believe in education. <laughs> <laughs> and I do, but I'm also aware that there are competing sources of information that I view as being evidence-free, <laughs> um, and that those drive people's emotions, um, and quite powerfully. Uh, but the other source of the emotions that I was talking about that predict the vote is the emotions that a particular candidate evokes in people. So a lot of that's conveyed non-verbally. So Ronald Reagan, for example, had a great smile, and, he, and people would respond to that by smiling at the television back, <laughs> you know, sort of unconsciously. And then that kind of makes you feel good, you know? So a candidate who smiles can evoke positive emotions in people. So it's not only the information that people are conveying, but it's also their nonverbals. And um, you know, one of the things that Donald Trump does is he looks dominant and strong. And if you turn off the sound on the television, you know, he looks like a very powerful person and conveys that. And people who are looking for strong leadership respond to that on a gut level. I think. So those are just examples of the sources of emotion. Um, but, so I think information is one source, but I also think that the person of the candidate um, is another source. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll continue to take questions. Uh, I want to mention that this is live streamed and we receive questions by Twitter. Um, and so one uh, that we should try to answer is the following. How can the Trump administration take concrete steps through policy to address inequality and poverty? Uh, 
So <laughs> that's a hard question. So I let you think about it while we take perhaps a, another one if it's a bit easier. Okay. I don't know if this is a bit easier, um, but it's particularly for Professor Lamont. Um, so one of the things I was struck about the dignity of working men is just how much that um, dignity was tied up um, not just to wo working class labor, but also to masculinity, nationality, <laughs> and ethnicity. And I think one of the big debates that's already kind of emerged on the kind of broad liberal left has been, you know, how much can we respond to this uh, sense of disrespect with a kind of economic populism that restores uh, these kinds of jobs, assuming that we can even do that. Um, but assuming we can even do that, can we do that in a way that doesn't then um, have a kind of exclusionary sort of uh, basis of respect and identity that then excludes minorities, uh, women and other groups? Well, <laughs> no. um, the kind of jobs that working class men have are typically jobs that are, well, there's both the nature of the job itself, which often, you know, requires strength, but there's also the status of the provider, which is extremely crucial to their sense of self. So the mere fact of being able to support a family or to allow their partner to only work half time was absolutely looming large as I did these uh, interviews. To me, it's really the, the structure of the family has changed drastically, and the reality of it is that very few working class men are now able to maintain these kinds of livelihood. So I think just as we see with younger working class men, many of them have been led to really question what it means to be a good father, these, these templates about what is a good father has changed drastically over the last 30 years. One of my graduate students who had done interviews with the so-called deadbeat dad argued that, you know, buying uh, diapers on a regular basis is really an important contribution to being a good dad. So I think, you know, you want to, uh, these templates about what defines masculinity and femininity are moving really, really fast. And, um, they are tied to the jobs that people have, but probably, you know, I hate to have such a trite conclusion, but I think there's a lot of, of work that needs to be done to be able to, to track this in a meaningful way, as opposed to, you know, staying with these visions of what, uh, you know, what, yeah. So I don't know, maybe someone who works on stereotype would have a view on the evolution of these things. Well, I think when I said that, you know, the demographics of the country are changing, um, gender roles are changing a lot too. And what's happened is most of the change has happened for women. So women are taking on more work roles and not giving up so much of the housework roles. Um, men are not doing the reciprocal thing as much. Um, so um, women have develop more role flexibility, whereas in general, on average, men have not changed as much in terms of role flexibility. So, you know, I've heard proposals that we don't, we shouldn't focus on fixing the women or fixing the men, but we should focus on fixing the jobs so that everybody can have more flexibility. And that, you know, if, if one person takes off for parental leave, that doesn't mean that the person's colleagues necessarily have more work to do, but you find ways to create jobs where people can fill in for each other, you know, as they need to take, say, parental leave or care leave, and that you could, you could, you could fix the jobs instead of trying to fix the men or fix the women. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for that. Good, so I propose that we uh, look at this question again about what the administration can do, but I'd like to broaden it a little bit and ask our three panelists if they wanted to, if they ha had the ear of the president, what advice would they give on their own uh, field, right, on, on, the, on the issue of inequality, poverty, discrimination, respect? Shall I go? Yeah, so again, basically going back to my uh, somewhat narrow <laughs> economic framework, uh, which essentially says that it's this technological juggernaut which has been coming at us for the last 20, 25 years, displacing basic labor in favor of skilled labor, in favor of capital, that that's the 
key part of the story in this thing. If you, if you buy that story, uh, then it seems to me that, that, that the, 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 uh, the reaction to that would be, well, create the skills which will meet that increasing demand. Okay, so that's, that's an obvious, and that's, I'm arguing that's what Latin America did in its own, in its own way. Okay? Uh, so I think that, that, that then leads to very specific policy uh, implications of how you would, how you would do that. Okay? The second thing, though, is that, is that, in fact, create the skills, but those are for, the, for new people. Okay? Somebody who is a, a 45, 50-year-old steel worker who has just been made unemployed is not going to become a, it's not going to become a computer programmer overnight, okay? It, their, their children could be trained in that way. But so we're going to have, for 30 years, the steel worker who has just become unemployed. So I think this is something that we have to think about in terms of a transfer strategy uh, or a, a strategy of, of targeted investment which will support those, uh, those jobs, those communities, it being recognized that there's a, there, this has been, uh, the problem has arisen because of technological change. So that's the second one. Essentially, it's a, it's, if you like, it's a transfer strategy to support those who we know in the next 30 years will not be able to become uh, the, uh, uh, the people who play in the, in, the new, in the new technology world. The third one, though, is the, is the most difficult. And this is, so I've been taking the technology juggernaut as being exogenous. It's just there, and it's coming at us, and, 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 and so on, okay? And that's typically how most people uh, analyze this, this thing. But Tony Atkinson, in a recent book, has argued, well, why? Why should we take that as exogenous? Can't we invest in new, can't we have R&D and have a, have a targeted investment program in R&D, which will create the new technologies, which will be more efficient than the current ones, but still be labor using, rather than labor displacing, okay? But, but that, of course, that, that's not in the, incenti that's not in the uh, interest of the pri of private sector. There are no incentives for the private sector to do that. That has to be a public sector activity. So these three things, create more skills. Secondly, get ready to transfer, to transfer in different ways to support those who've been, uh, who, who are displaced. And thirdly, a massive investment program in terms of new technologies which will be labor using, but still more efficient than the current, current ones. Well, I guess I would ask him to think about uh, production, distribution, and recognition. I think a lot of what he talked about during the uh, campaign were related to questions of production, reviving the American economy, and questions of distribution, questions of taxation. I think, all, however, a lot of his policies were not oriented toward income redistribution, although he had some good ideas about uh, various uh, about college, et cetera. Uh, what he never talked about is recognition. He's totally blind to the fact that this is a social process that can be engineered through uh, uh, systematic messaging about you know, public service announcement. Uh, I remember once in San Francisco coming out of the uh, subway and there was <coughs> a, a huge uh, gay pride uh, flag uh, celebrating the diversity of the community. And I think a lot of that can be done, and I think it would pay handsomely to him to the extent that a lot of the people who are extremely anxious about him becoming a president has to do precisely with the fact that he has zero concern with recognition and social inclusion. So I think the mobilization of women on, on uh, January 21st is, of course, uh, you know, the march on Washington is very much tied to the fact that people are extremely concerned about abortion and about, you know, these conversion schools for gay people. But uh, much more broadly, if he were to acknowledge the issues of, you know, pecking order and, and proclaim that this is going to be the country for everyone in many ways, that I think it would make a very big difference. I guess I would urge him to look at it as a business proposition that it's short-sighted as a businessman to uh, ignore human capital of large groups of people in our society who can contribute, and that you know women are 50 percent. That's a pretty important piece of social of, of capital uh, for a skill base. Um, immigrants <coughs> actually. My interpretation of the data is that immigrants grow the economy, and they grow local economies, um, and so, you know, and so on. So I would, I would, 
urge him to see investments in the people we have here in the country now and also in education to, you know, is a good business investment. So I used to work at a large state school and when the budget was always being cut, what would stop the free fall in the budget was when the often Republican businessmen would say, excuse me, we need trained people in this state in order to have our businesses flourish. So I think, you know, I would try to talk about human capital as a business reality and business investment. So we are getting uh, uh, close to the end, but we can take one last question. Um, this is a related question. Um, it sounds like the economists have a fairly good idea of what needs to be done and the sorts of policies that would be successful in combating inequality. And I'm wondering more generally why these policies aren't happening um, in the US and the UK. I mean, you, you've talked about how they are happening in Latin America and in China, and that's great. <coughs> but um, what needs to change what needs to change for these policies to come into play? Um, it seems unlikely that they're going to happen under a Trump presidency, and unfortunately, but they didn't happen under an Obama presidency either, exactly. Um, and I'm wondering whether that's because, say, the government is controlled by special interests, or whether that's because of group boundaries, or whether it's because of belief in meritocracy and the American dream. Um, why, so if, if inequality is due to bad policy, then what's the bad policy due to? Well, uh, if I knew the answer to that question, uh, I wouldn't be an economist, I guess, is the, uh, is the answer. So, so uh, I'll give you my own, my own sort of a, a take, a take on this. And uh, you said if inequality is caused by bad policy, what causes uh, the bad policy? And I guess uh, Joe Stiglitz has recently written about this and talking about spirals that you can get into. Okay? So essentially, one can trace it back to a deregulatory push uh, in the 1980s, uh, which then led to uh, accretions, of, accretions of wealth in certain groups. And then given the way the political system works, that accretion then led to further use of that. Okay? And we had very systematic reductions, let's say, in the top marginal tax rates uh, in this country and also in, in, in the UK, uh, uh, for that matter. So you can ask me, well, what led to the, to the, what led to the 1980s? Thing? But you know, we could go back forever. So I think that's, that, I think, is a way of thinking about this, which is that the rules, that there was an initial move which changed the financial thing, and that then led to rewriting of the further rules to benefit the same group, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then, then you said to me, how can we therefore break out of this? Uh, and I guess it has to hit bottom before, uh, before it can uh, go up again. So I, I don't have a good answer is the, is the answer. Hmm? <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. I think we should give a big round of applause to our panelists. <laughs>